Hi, my name is Barry Satterfield. Welcome to this presentation. In our last session, we looked at earth catastrophes in the book of Job. There we saw the Ice Age began as a result of an axis tilt that was caused by eight major asteroid impacts. In this session, we will want to look at some of the features of the Ice Age and then how it ended and the evidence for this from astronomy, archaeology and climatology. So let's get started. Let's give part of it away right now. That axis tilt had to be corrected, and it was, by another series of smaller asteroid impacts. And it is because of this earth shock ending the Ice Age that we also have the answer to three biblical events that have puzzled people for years. Because we are covering so much material, this will be a two-part series. The Ice Age started after the third major catastrophe in the geologic column, the KT or Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction. More details are on the Bible and Geology and the Bible and Time videos which are linked below. In the KT extinction, eight large asteroid impacts, shown by the stars here, split the Earth's original supercontinent apart. This separation was rapid at first, creating the Atlantic Rift, right, and wrinkling up the mountain chains and volcanoes around the Pacific Ring of Fire. The hits were one-sidedly in the north and close together, as Africa, America and Europe were all one landmass, even though the blue areas on the left map were shallow seas. This one-sided hitting resulted in an increased axis tilt, which then initiated the Ice Age. If the Earth had no axis tilt, the Sun would always uniformly illuminate both hemispheres, as in the left image. Consequently, there would be no seasons. When the axis is tilted, the situation in the two yellow images results in seasons. In one part of the year, the North Pole is pointed away from the Sun, giving a northern winter, but towards the Sun in summer. A high axis tilt cools a much larger area around the poles in winter. During the Ice Age, the extent of the ice sheets is shown in dark blue here. They extended from the North Pole and covered much of North America, as well as Greenland and Iceland. Scandinavia was covered as well, and regions well to the south of that, and much of Russia. On the extreme top right, it can be seen that the Bering Strait is covered. This, plus lowered sea levels, may have allowed migration from Asia across to Alaska and the USA. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, has explained in four steps how a high axis tilt produces an ice age. 1. When the tilt of the planetary spin axis is high, ice in polar latitudes turns to water vapour, increasing humidity. 2. Winds transport the water vapour to lower latitudes. 3. The water vapour deposits ice on the surface at lower latitudes. And 4. Higher humidity moves the surface ice stability region towards the equator. Ice then persists and accumulates. One of the features of the last ice age, known as the Pleistocene Ice Age, were the giant mammals. Among them, the huge woolly mammoths, and the giant woolly rhinoceros are well known, as shown here. Others are the saber-toothed tiger, the giant ground sloth, and the giant elk. There was the giant kangaroo, which was over 12 feet high. Then, as shown on the left, the diprotodon or giant wombat, the size of a hippopotamus, roamed the land. There was also the recent New Zealand discovery of the giant penguin, the size of a human. An initial reconstruction from Canterbury Museum, New Zealand, is shown on the right. A number of these creatures, and others like the Mastodon, appear in Ice Age cave art, as displayed here. Also prominent among these paintings are wild bulls such as these. However, closer inspection reveals something else. Notice the bull in the area enclosed by the red circle. We will now zoom into that segment and magnify it. The left image is the cave art. 
the right image is a star map of the region around the constellation of Taurus the Bull. The three red arrows on the star map from right to left point to the beautiful Pleiades cluster of stars. The painting has an exactly equivalent group under the right arrow. The middle arrow on both the star map and the painting points to the V-shaped Hyades cluster with the bright star Aldebaran as the eye of the bull. Finally, the left arrow on both the map and the painting points to the three prominent stars marking the belt of the constellation Orion. In other words, it shows that considerable intelligence was at work as the cave artist was actually making a star map. From this we have excellent evidence that cavemen were not semi-human, but were simply ordinary intelligent people who were living in caves to shelter from extreme Ice Age conditions. This followed an impact winter. But if we had a nuclear winter, we could easily find ourselves again in a similar situation as part of the recovery sequence. The Pleistocene Ice Age ended with another impact event. We think of large meteorites being maybe uh, hundreds of feet across, but this event involved a shower of objects up to more than half a mile across. One of the smaller pieces formed a two mile wide crater in Iraq, shown on the left. One of the larger pieces formed a 20 mile wide crater on the edge of the Hiawatha Glacier in Greenland, shown on the right. As we will see, there is very strong evidence for a change in the axis tilt at this time, righting it somewhat. This allowed the glacial ice to start melting. Dr. Benny Pizer and colleagues of the Cambridge Conference Group collected data on at least 10 worldwide impacts in this time slot. He also researched a group of over 12 lake-filled craters in Rio Cuarto, Argentina. The group is mapped top left, an image from the air top right and below. These low angle impact craters had impact glass and meteoric material on their floors, which precludes other origins. As all 22 research craters were formed near a similar time, it is likely they were all part of a swarm of asteroidal debris. The yellow stars show the probable associated impacts. The main impact from this debris cloud appears to be the Burkle Crater, 18 to 20 miles wide, in the Western Indian Ocean. The base of the crater is in Ice Age strata, so it marked the close of that time. For any crater to form by impact at this ocean depth requires an impact door to be at least half a mile wide. The thin lines shown coming from the nearby coastlines mark where giant tsunamis deposited debris resulting from the explosive impact of this object on the ocean floor. The Burkle Crater impact is shown by the yellow star here. The resulting series of tsunamis formed structures shown in red in Australia, Madagascar, Africa and India. These V-shaped geological structures are called chevrons. The red spot between India and Sri Lanka gives one location in the Gulf of Manar. Let us zoom in to that location. This is shown in detail on the left. The tsunami came up the Gulf of Manar and the evidence suggests that the wave reached almost to Madurai, marked by the red spot. This town is about 60 miles inland and is 650 feet above sea level. The implication, supported by Tamil legends, is that the out-of-place boulder, shown on the right, was also dumped then. Tsunamis of this size can achieve that feat. In one of the scientific papers about this event, it was noted that Burkle impact tsunamis travelled east 4,200 miles to Coffin Bay, South Australia, shown on the left image. As they mounted up over the land, the tsunamis formed white sand dunes 300 feet high, visible from space, as shown in the upper right. The bottom right shows these huge dunes from the ground. Their composition is different from all other coastal dunes in South Australia, which suggests a unique origin. Here are some of the four tsunami chevrons in Madagascar. They are 1,250 miles from the Burkle crater itself, three miles from the ocean, 
and are about 590 feet high. The long axis of these chevrons points directly to Burkle Crater. To form these structures, the tsunami waves would have to be well over 600 feet high. This means that the impactor was over a mile wide, moving at 20 miles per second as it hit the ocean. In proportion to a city, the tsunami would look something like this or higher. The tsunami waves on Madagascar left evidence of penetrating 45 miles inland along the Chevron axes. Massive boulders can be carried by such powerful waves. Some boulders in Australia from other impact tsunamis weigh up to 285 tonnes and are 40 feet above current sea level. But there is other evidence that the Madagascar chevrons were from the Burkle impact. Madagascar chevron samples were analysed by scanning electron microscopes at Drexel University, Philadelphia. They found, and I quote, Microfossils from the Indian Ocean had melded with the condensing metals, nickel iron and iridium, from the asteroid. Both were lofted out of the sea by the impact explosion, then carried long distances by the tsunamis. End quote. Thus, the Madagascar chevrons came from the Burkle impact. This is documented in a 2006 report by D. Brieger, Director of Microscopy at Drexel University. Others involved in this research include Sharad Master, top right, of the Impact Cratering Research Group. They dated the Iraq impact archaeologically from 2350 to 2200 BC. Below him, left to right, are Dallas Abbott, Bruce Massey and Edward Bryant, who are part of the Holocene Impact Working Group. They studied a large number of craters, including Burkle, which they gave a date of formation archaeologically around 2800 BC. Dallas Abbott from this group said that for the Burkle impact to produce these results, quote, the impact explosion has been estimated to be the equivalent of at least 10 megatons of TNT, or roughly 650 Hiroshima-type bombs, end quote. This plus associated impacts, would cause fires, earthquakes, tsunamis and general archaeological destruction. Dr Abbott said this set of impacts, quote, have profoundly affected Earth's natural systems, climate and human societies, end quote. Archaeology and climatology bear this out. Substantial fire and ash layers are associated with this time. Archaeology shows that worldwide, Many known advanced cultures were destroyed by earthquakes, tsunamis, fire and associated disasters in the interval 2500 to 2200 BC. Fires and ash layers show the results of scorching winds from the impacts. The associated archaeological dating of events around 2400 BC largely coincides with the timing of the impacts discussed here. Some of the Mediterranean civilizations destroyed around 2400 to 2200 BC by earthquakes and massive fires include the regions of Anatolia, Greece, Crete, Cyprus and Malta. Tsunamis may have been involved on the islands. Their cultures before and after this event were markedly different. In a similar way, Many Mideast civilizations were destroyed in the period 2400 to 2200 BC. They included cultures in Iran, Mesopotamia, Syria and Palestine. The early dynastic period of classical Sumer ended 2350 BC. Similarly, the Old Kingdom in Egypt ended about 2300 to 2200 BC. On the Indian subcontinent, some significant cultures were wiped out about 2300 BC. In both India and Pakistan, earthquakes and fires with thick ash layers entered these civilizations. They included the pre harappan cultures in the Indus Valley. A large number of cultures around the Pacific Rim were also destroyed during the period 2500 to 2200 BC. They included societies in China, Japan, the Philippines, Thailand, Australasia, the Southwest Pacific, the Americas, as well as the Eskimos in the Arctic. 
Some of the key people involved in this archaeological research were Professor Claude Schaefer, Dr Benny Pizer and Dr Ewan Mackay and other members of the Cambridge Conference Group and the Society for Interdisciplinary Studies. Important contributions also came from Dr Moe Mandelker. These impacts not only wiped out civilizations, they changed the world's climate. Two investigators on this topic are Drs Mike Bailey, shown on the left, and Johnny McEnany. Their conference paper presented in October 2015 details the 2200 BC climate anomaly. This was also investigated in considerable detail earlier by Moe Mandelker. His publication entitled The 2300 BC Event, Part 2, Climatological Evidence, is key research. He concludes, and I quote, In summary, there is strong evidence for a sustained global temperature change about 2300 BC, supported by both deep sea ocean temperature changes and earthwide climatic changes. End quote. Up to this point, we've established three things. One, sometime in the period from 2500 to 2200 BC, archaeology shows that many civilizations worldwide were wiped out by a series of disasters. Two, independent evidence from climate studies shows global weather changes occurred starting around 2300 BC. Three, a swarm of asteroid debris formed impact craters whose origins cluster around 2400 BC. This third item, these impacts, become the suspected cause of the rest. As we mentioned before, the evidence indicates the Ice Age was brought about by a high axis tilt, over 27 degrees. This was caused by a series of eight asteroid impacts from objects over 10 miles across. Many hit in water, which aided the intense impact winter that led to the Ice Age. The size of the resulting ice sheet, as seen from the North Pole, is shown on the left image. The only way the Ice Age could have ended was if the axis tilt was lessened by a later series of smaller impacts that caused the axis tilt to become the 23.4 degrees that we have today. The extent of the ice sheet around North Pole is seen on the right. How do we know these impacts lessened the axis tilt, ended the ice age and so changed the climate? The answer comes from the research of the late government astronomer for South Australia, George F. Dodwell, pictured here. He studied the change in the Earth's axis tilt, sometimes called the obliquity. In particular, he examined the axis tilt or obliquity as measured and recorded by many ancient observers going back as far as 2045 BC. As a widely respected astronomer, Dodwell knew about the expected long-term variation in the tilt of the Earth's axis. Here, this is shown over a period of 120,000 years. This expected variation is due to the gravitational pull of the Sun, Moon and planets on the Earth's equatorial bulge. The expected theoretical variation would range from a little more than 22 degrees to about 24.5 degrees. However, the curve of actual observations is shown by the almost vertical line. This reveals that the measured axis tilt was at least 27 degrees, that is 3 degrees greater than expected, near 2345 BC. The question is, how would the ancients have known how to measure the axis tilt of the Earth? This curve of observations was possible because the ancient astronomers measured the axis tilt by a vertical pole called a nomen. Here is the one set up by Caesar Augustus in Rome. The position of the shadow of the nomen gives us all the information we need. The day illustrated here is the equinox, when the sun stands directly above the equator. The sun rises due east and sets due west on that day. So the shadow moves along the straight line, shown by the red arrow, and enters the temple at the right. The ancient observers used a nomen in two ways to find the axis tilt. To understand how, look at the Earth in its orbit. 
the plane of the Earth's orbit is called the ecliptic. But the Earth's polar axis is tilted to this plane. As the June solstice, when the Sun is at its furthest point north, as seen from the Earth, the North Pole area points towards the Sun, left image. The South Pole is then in darkness. At the December solstice, when the Sun is at its furthest point south, the South Pole region points towards the Sun, as in the right image, and the North Pole is then in darkness. Here is the position of the Sun near the horizon at sunset, during the first half of a year seen from a fixed northern hemisphere site. The Sun at left is close to its sunset position in March, at the equinox, when it stands above the equator. The Sun at extreme right is seen setting from the same location but in June, near the summer solstice, when it is at its furthest point north. If a thick rod was in the ground where the observer is standing, the position of the shadow of the rod cast by the setting sun could be noted at those two times. The angle the two shadows make at the rod is the same as the axis tilt angle. The second way of measuring the axis tilt with a nomen is by noting the position of the midday shadow. At the summer or June solstice, that shadow length is shortest for the year, indicated by EG on this illustration. At the winter solstice at noon, the shadow is its longest at midday. This is indicated by EK. In both the spring and the autumn, there occurs an equinox when the day and night are of equal length. That shadow is marked by the middle letter H. The distance from either the midsummer or midwinter shadow to the equinox shadow gives the angle of the Earth's axis tilt. So either GFH or HFK will show that angle. Today, cross-checks are available which tell us that these ancient measurements are both reliable and accurate. In all, Dodwell found 66 ancient yet accurate axis tilt observations. The earliest was in 2045 BC from Egypt. The yellow arrow points to the variation expected according to theory, if present conditions held back then. The red arrow points to what the ancient measurements actually indicate. The observation curve shows that prior to 2345 BC, the axis tilt was over 27 degrees. In 2345 BC, measurements show that a strong change in the axis tilt occurred. Eventually, in, by 1850, today's tilt of 23.4 degrees was reached, giving our milder conditions. But the initial change would have been fast and somewhat dramatic. The earliest measurement from Egypt had to do with the Karnak Temple. This 1914 image of that huge complex is seen from the air. In 2045 BC, the long axis of this temple was built to point directly to the setting sun at the June solstice, the evening when the sun had reached its furthest point north. On that occasion, the sun would shine directly down the 900-foot avenue, marked in red, to the altar. A special ceremony, called the Manifestation of Ra, was held annually on that June solstice sunset. The priests would throw open the sanctuary doors at one end, this would illuminate the entire corridor, and the setting sun's rays would be focused on the Egyptian gods in gold, silver and jewels. Pharaoh in his gorgeous array stood with them. The sun god Ra and Pharaoh were one in light and splendour. But, as can be seen from this recent image, the sun sets too far to the south to shine through the gate and down the avenue with today's tilt. The sun is setting to the left, south of this avenue alignment now. If you look closely at this photo, you'll see the small gate which was the original opening to the avenue. This gate allows a precise solstice sunset alignment. The difference between then and now is evident on the following sketch. The Karnak Temple Avenue gives the axis tilt very precisely. Simple surveying fixes the original alignment in 2045 BC. This diagram was drawn in 1936 
and shows clearly the changing sunset line, marked by a red star. Even given a possible error margin in the date of plus or minus 150 years, we still have the same range of dates, namely 2500 to 2200 BC, as all those events occurred as recorded by archaeology, astronomy and climatology. Now Egypt is only one example of the evidence of this axis tilt and the resulting destruction of so many cultures. As Dodwell researched, he found evidence from China, India, South America and Arabian astronomy for this event. He looked at Stonehenge again and found strong evidence that this also was originally built to determine the new astronomical pattern that had begun. Below we have linked the Dodwell material for those who are interested. These changes and destructions are linked in time to the lesser impacts ending the Ice Age. These impacts would have been the direct cause of massive earthquakes, fires, tsunamis and general chaos that affected the world around 2400 BC. There will be a more complete discussion of how all these are connected and the mechanism whereby the axis tilt changed with these lesser impacts in part 2. Right now, however, it's important to discuss the actual time of the Ice Age. According to atomic dating, the Ice Age started about 2.6 million years ago and ended 12,000 years ago or 10,000 BC. However, as was previously mentioned, archaeological evidence indicates the Ice Age may have ended more recently. The data presented here suggests the impacts around 2400 BC ended the Ice Age. This is supported by all the Dodwell event data and is in agreement with archaeology, climate and earth core studies. This situation is highlighted by Burkle Crater. We get two different dates from professionals in different fields because they are using two different ways of measuring time. The normal way is to measure the time it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun once, our year or the moon to go once around the Earth, our month. This is orbital time, and this orbital rate is constant and has been since recorded history. Orbital time is governed by gravity. The second way to measure time is through atomic processes. This includes the time an electron takes to travel once around the atomic nucleus, as well as other examples like radiometric dating. These ways are not connected to gravity at all. Instead, all atoms are controlled by electric and magnetic processes. There is a standard presumption that this atomic rate has always been the same as now, and therefore unchanging. But the actual data disagree with that presumption. This was discussed in the sessions The Bible and Time and The Bible and Geology, which are linked below. Ancient records... Archaeology and other data suggested that the date range for the Burkle impact is 2800 to 2400 BC on the orbital clock. Papers and presentations were given by various groups on that basis. In 2017, however, atomic dating was done on samples from the Burkle impact. They gave an average formation date near 12,000 years before present on the atomic clock. Atomically, this is the date of the end of the Ice Age, and Burkle Crater did form in Ice Age strata. But researchers were puzzled by this difference in dating. If atomic processes were running at a constant rate, just as gravitational processes do, the date should match. Although this did not start out to be my field of research, what I have found in the last 40 years has offered a solution to the time problem where the difference between orbital and atomic time is concerned. This has been discussed fully on previous YouTube videos which are linked at the bottom, as well as in my papers, both published and for the net on my website. Let us now do a quick review of this solution to the time problem. Space, the entire universe, is filled with something called the zero-point energy, or ZPE. The ZPE is the result of the rapid expansion of the early universe. In the same way that energy is put into the fabric of a balloon being inflated, energy was put into the fabric of space as it expanded. 
As early expansion continued, the ZP strength built up. The ZP strength controls the electric and magnetic properties of the vacuum. Any increase of the zero-point energy results, necessarily, in the slowing of electric and magnetic effects. So atomic clocks ticked much faster in the past and slowed down as space expanded and the ZPE built up. Data from astronomy shows how the ZPE has increased with time. This is shown in the left graph. Atomic clocks slowed inversely, shown by the right graph. Thus we can correct atomic time to read ordinary orbital time using this well-defined curve. There's more on this in the Bible and Time and other sessions which are linked below. The Pleistocene Ice Age lasted from 2.6 million atomic years ago to about 12,000 atomic years ago. When the astronomical correction is applied to the atomic clocks, it actually lasted from near 2900 BC until about 2300 BC in ordinary orbital time. The two ways of measuring time then coincide and the research from the different teams is verified. So how does standard geology explain the Ice Age in its apparent warmer periods? They use something called Milankovitch cycles. The idea is that natural global warmer and cooler periods follows a semi-regular but very long-term variation. This graph shows that prediction back for 800,000 years. These cycles include the apparent warmer and cooler stages of the Ice Age. More generally, it includes the weather patterns and temperature changes the Earth undergoes. The cycles themselves are supposed to be governed by three interacting items. The first of these is the Earth's axis tilt or obliquity, taken back into the past or on into the future. The variation in this quantity is based on the pull of the Sun, Moon and planets on our equatorial bulge. This essentially gives us a result like Stockwell's formula, which was discussed earlier in the context of how the Earth's axis should have been tilted in the past. This shows that over the period of 41,000 years, the axis tilt should have varied from an angle of 22.1 degrees to 24.5 degrees. The problem is that back in 2345 BC, there was a dramatic and unexpected change. The tilt then was in excess of 27 degrees. So the Stockwell formula doesn't work because it does not take account of this change. This means that the Milankovitch cycles which depend on it, or something like it, must be re-examined. The second factor governing the Milankovitch cycle is the present and past rate of something called the precession of the axis. The axis may have a more or less fixed angle from the vertical, a tilt, but the direction in which the axis points traces a large circle, like a spinning top or gyroscope. This is called precession. The rate and direction of precession depends on the tilt of the axis. Because the Earth's precession depends on its axis tilt, and because the axis tilt has been shown to be unexpectedly different before 2345 BC, then the rate of precession must also have been very different from that calculated for the Milankovitch cycles. The conclusion is that the Milankovitch cycle model cannot be used to explain Ice Age data or track climate in the past. To put one more proverbial nail in the coffin, the prediction of Milankovitch cycles also depends on the third factor, something called orbital eccentricity. The Earth does not track a perfect circle around the Sun, it's slightly elliptical. This is called orbital eccentricity, and it varies very slightly over a period of 100,000 years. However, even those promoting the Milankovitch cycles admit that changes in our orbital eccentricity are so tiny as to be insignificant next to the effect of the axis tilt and precession. Since the axis tilt and precession data are so different from the theory of what should be happening from Milankovitch cycles, then the eccentricity argument is not valid either. In the long run, this means we have to discard these cycles because they are an unreliable source for dating. The Milankovitch cycle model also is used to try and explain the various layers in ice cores, such as shown here. 
we do indeed see layering when we pull up ice cores. If we go by the way things are today, then the assumption is made that these are annual layers. The result may initially appear to support the Milankovitch cycle model, but first of all, that model does not reflect axial tilt reality and so doesn't work. Second, when we try to determine the effects of past processes by what we see happening now, we have to ignore a lot of geological data. That data indicates some very nasty catastrophes which the Earth has undergone. Catastrophes make things happen fast. Asteroid impacts in shallow seas, such as in the KT extinction event, elevate very significant quantities of water vapour and find debris high into the atmosphere and spread it globally. Associated volcanism also adds impressively to this and reinforces a severe and long-lasting impact winter. The variety of atmospheric instabilities will cause changes in the jet streams, resulting in massive and repeated storm surges. With a much higher water vapour content, this will precipitate as rain, snow and ice. In cold areas, these storm surges will accumulate many layers of snow each season. As these layers become compacted, they form what we see in the ice cores and their layers, which would not then be annual. The ages of these cores is not always found by counting the numbers of layers. Instead, it's done by measuring the presence and ratios of certain elements and gases in them, such as argon, potassium and carbon dioxide. Dating using these methods are forms of atomic clock, which we noted above was ticking faster in the past. This means the date derived from radiometric dating is too old for its actual age on the orbital clock. This atomic method is usually used when layers are absent or hard to determine, and also if blue ice is present. Thus the ice core shown here has a dark layer from volcanic debris which dated as 21,000 years old atomically. But this atomic dating in all its forms has to be called into question because of the build-up of the zero-point energy and its slowing effects on atomic processes. There is a similar problem with dating something called valves. Valves are fine layers of sediment, often preserved as rocks, although sometimes they are still damp deposits. Clearly, valves are cyclical deposits. The example here are valves in rock strata that was formed in a glacial lake in Montana. It is presumed that the layers are annual, reflecting seasonal deposits. However, in some cases at least, it has turned out that these valves are not seasonal at all, but are probably diurnal. In this way they are reflecting the tides and therefore indicating as many as two daily deposits. Here's another example. The Alatina formation in South Australia, part image here, averages 120 to 150 metres in thickness and in some places extends to 250 metres thick. It is composed of very fine, valve-like layered materials or laminations. It had been presumed that this formation took millions of years to form. Closer study then indicated that these were not annual valves at all, but tidal deposits. As a result, a time of several million years for the Alatina formation to be formed was then shrunk down to about 60 years. The scientific about face on this was presented in an article entitled Blame It on the Moon. In a similar way, the valve-like deposits from Lake Sugetsu in Japan are now claimed to give a 100,000-year chronology for the Ice Age and validify the Milankovitch cycles. Lake Sugetsu is shown here by the red dot. The system in which it is involved includes the Hasu River coming in from the right, marked by a yellow arrow, and the Sea of Japan at Wasaka Bay in the upper left and centre. This is similar to the system, but on a smaller scale, that gave rise to the Alatina formation. As a result, it is possible that the lake deposits are not annual or seasonal, but monthly due to storm surges and or daily due to tidal influences. We must also remember that Japan is one of the most active seismic and volcanic zones in the world. The largest earthquakes are associated with tsunamis. This map, 
plots the location and depths of earthquakes of Richter 5 magnitude or greater in Japan for just 50 years, from 1960 to 2011. The number of quakes would have been higher when continental drift rates were faster. Earth movement of any type will affect deposition rates. As a consequence, Lake Sugetsu being one of the most seismically active areas on Earth would be subject to catastrophic changes. A chronology of 100,000 years may thus be open to question on several counts. What we have discussed so far is the Ice Age, how and when it started, and the accumulation of data on how and when it ended. We have discussed the merits and otherwise of the two different dating methods and the reconciliation of the two time scales. The role played by the zero-point energy seems to be the key that resolves that problem. Even if ZPE was only mentioned briefly here, it is more fully explained in our previous YouTube set video sessions. Yet that is not all. There is even more important data linked with the shower of asteroid impacts of 2345 BC, which needs to be presented. For example, research by Kawai et al., published in Nature in 1972, established that the direction of movement of the Earth's geomagnetic pole underwent a remarkable change about 2345 BC. The path of the magnetic pole is shown here. This implies that something happened at that time which involved the Earth's core. This opens up another aspect of impact-related effects which is not often considered. A fuller study of what happened in 2345 BC to the Earth's core provides a series of answers to problems that astronomers have had for quite some time. In addition, it supplies answers to biblical problems that Bible students have had for a number of generations. This will form the basis of what we do in part two of this presentation. We hope you found this presentation interesting and exciting, and we look forward to your participation in part two. Thank you for your time.